I'm talking to Pradeep Goel, Goal, and he's from Solvecare, the CEO. He's been in life care all his life, and I want to discuss with you what uh, Solvecare stands for and how we can use it in, uh, in real life. Um, first, uh, Pradeep, you've been in healthcare all the time. How did you get into, involved in healthcare, and what are, have been your roles in the past? Um, pleasure to be here. Um, the first uh, question about how I got into healthcare. Actually, healthcare has been my entire career. I started my first healthcare IT company when I was young and foolish in college, um, studying for my for my degree, and decided that I wanted to do something in addition to be a student. Uh, so, started a healthcare IT company. Didn't really think of it as healthcare back then. It was more a workflow and 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 a paperless office idea. But very quickly, healthcare became our first and our largest client, uh, and then there was no looking back. So. I have uh, built four companies in healthcare so far, uh, one from an insurance company perspective, one from an employer benefit management perspective, one from a consumer self-service and, and um, perspective, and then one from a government program administration perspective. So rightfully or wrongfully, I've been very involved in healthcare from all sides, yeah. and I've seen it from all angles. So it's been uh, quite a journey, about 26 years now. I would say the last one you were talking about, you worked for a couple of presidents, you know, like the last one, Obama, and before that, Bush. You were involved in putting up the state part of the uh, Obama, uh, you know, Obamacare system, right? It, it must, how long did that take? And it must have been an, a reasonable nightmare. <laughs> yes, it was very challenging. And the Obamacare uh, implementation, the state had really two very big and separate parts. The first part was expanding the care to the poor, as they call the working poor. And what Obamacare did was expanded the safety net from the really poor to also the working poor. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing is called Medicaid expansion. So there was a tremendous amount of work that needed to be done to allow for the new population that was eligible, that is now eligible under Obamacare to get state government assistance in healthcare, to get their eligibility done, get them enrolled in the program, give them the right program to, uh, to participate in, manage their care, manage their costs, ensure that they're not getting underserved or overserved. It was a very complex uh, challenge. And we did, did that also for all the different states, right? I mean, you made a system that all the states, in all the states, companies could, you know, basically put their system in the exchange. Exactly. So each state had to do it, but every state did it differently. And it was a... <laughs> It's a, a very complex exercise in a very short time frame. And the biggest challenge with Obamacare Medicaid expansion was from the time the law was passed to the deadline to turn it on was months. And that's just very difficult. <laughs> hundreds of millions of citizens being impacted by it. And then there was a political challenges that we all have heard about of, you know, governors wanting to do Medicaid expansion, but the legislature not wanting to do it and so on. But we succeeded. And uh, I'm proud to say that Millions more people have care as a result of our tireless efforts, although I think it gave me a lot of gray hair in a very short time frame. Well, you have a little bit of boldness, but not too many gray hairs, so uh, we'll see about that. Now, then, uh, this, why did you um, join you know, the, the about 500 other companies which wanted to do an ICO and, and basically start with solve care and jump on the blockchain wagon? When did that idea get started? So the idea of doing a decentralized care ledger, I have been thinking about that for at least 10 years. This is nothing for me new at all. Um, and I've been trying to implement that through different models of architecture, health information exchanges, interoperability, service-oriented architecture, you name it. You know, as technologies became more interoperable, we tried to implement that. In one of my roles in the past was an insurance company CIO. I was CIO of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, up in uh, in the north, and we had the almost entire population of our state on our on our healthcare, and it was my job to connect all the hospitals, the labs, the pharmacies, the doctors in my state to my centralized systems, and you know I we spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to do it, with some marginal success, but never what we ever never we aspired to do. It was always short of what we wanted to do. So it, it has been my lifelong journey to figure out a way to coordinate care better, to administer care better, and to pay for care more efficiently and accurately. So I got into this whole area realizing that blockchain DLT, if you will, distributed ledgers, could allow me to bring these orthogonal parties who don't trust each other, 
don't like each other in most cases, or at least they feel that their interests are not being served well, to come together and share the right information in a manner that is appropriately transparent, but also not completely transparent, because there is self-interest and self-protection involved. So I, I saw that what DLT could do is to allow me as an insurance company to administer benefits between you and your doctor without standing between you and the doctor. And that really is the epitome of what I thought would change healthcare and can change healthcare. It's an ability to govern without being an impediment, ability to set guidelines without being in the middle approving everything. Uh, and five of the biggest problems in healthcare are access to care, uh, coordinate scheduling of care, the quality of care, the measurement of quality, and the payment for the right quality, right? These are the five fundamental problems you have in every healthcare system. I don't care whether you are in the most efficient healthcare system or the least efficient. Yeah, so if you use it in the right way, we can fix these. For example, access to care. Do I really need you, the insurance company, to tell me which doctor I can see? Why do you need to tell me that? Why can't I go see the doctor I want to see as long as the doctor agrees to your contract under which I, he gets paid the right amount? So instead of having you pre-approve doctors and make provider networks, which is what I used to do as an insurance CIO, I would rather you, the patient, and you, the doctor, negotiate a contract that I can accept, which is bound to my smart contract, if you will, using the technical term. But really, I just want to make sure the guidelines are met. So let, let you schedule directly with the, with the physician, eliminates a lot of pain and has a lot of health care, improves access to care. But not to get too deep, I'm focused on how do we improve access to care through scheduling and the right physician availability and the right referral model where the physician can refer me to a specialist without somebody else having to approve it. Then there is a second element, me making sure that I'm using my benefits the right way. I'm over properly utilizing it, not duplicating it, not over utilizing it, and not certainly abusing the system. But reverse is true as well. I want the physician to be able to tell me that the care practices that they are using to treat my condition are somewhat aligned with the best practices. I don't want to find out later on that tests that should have been done weren't done and the tests that were done weren't necessary. So those are the type of uh, alignments we can achieve if we have a care ledger, which is my vision that we have a care event ledger that allows me to numerically measure and improve administration, coordination, measurement and payment of care. Okay, it's, so, an, it's an event ledger. So it's, an, it's a ledger of all kinds of medical events. What information is there, and more importantly, what information is not on that ledger, and how is it being put on the? How is it being put into the blockchain? So, great question. I want to circle back, if I may, about your previous question of how did we get into ICO because they're related. So, we when we realized that blockchain is a way to solve these very long-standing issues, we started to explore how best to get a blockchain platform and a community behind it that can actually support the implementation of this model of care in every economy, in every country. So we came to the idea that a platform supported by community that engages not just the developers, but clinicians, physicians, if you will, medical pharmacists, lab technicians to come together would allow us to adapt this model of care to every country. So the idea was to bring, is to bring community and capital and um, the, uh, uh, the platform together and the best mechanism to do that with a global ambition that we have to change healthcare around the world was to use this token sale model where we can engage clients, we can engage developers and community of physicians, and we can build a platform that can be infinitely expandable by every, you know, uh, every community. If you think about it, our goal is a care protocol, which is our care event management layer in blockchain. It should work differently in China than it works in California. That's a given. But it should be configured by the community in China differently than California. So a lot of this was driven by the three Cs coming together, clients, community, and capital. And I felt that the token sale model could, when properly used, incentivize everyone to participate in the right outcomes. Okay. Uh, and the, sort of the reason why, instead of going to private capital, private venture, or private equity or venture capital, or doing an IPO, I felt that an ICO may be a better option. Now, time will tell if you're right, but I do see a, a better alignment of interests in this model than I see in a venture-funded model. So, uh, and I mean, you have basically issued uh, 1.3 billion tokens, and the biggest part, 
77 percent is for the is is basically offered for sale and what is what is going what is happening with that uh, that money because you only have 11 percent you have about 20 percent for the care team and the community bound teams and the long term uh, and the foundation but what is the other money what, what's happening to that other 80 percent so great question so the community is actually a second biggest piece of our allocation of tokens the, uh, we wanted to make sure that the community is building care cards. So our vision is uh, to have a, uh, well, we're building it today. It's not really a vision at this point. We are far down the development path, but the care wallet, which is the centerpiece of our, our product, is what you and I and the physician and the technician and the employer has in their hand on their mobile phone or on their iPad, and through which they're interacting with the care event ledger on the chain. But they're looking at the events that they have subscribed to or they have the right to subscribe to. So I may be only subscribed to financial events or events that impact financial decisions. You may, as a physician, be subscribed to clinical events as well as uh, as lab results, but you don't really need to see other events that are not relevant to my care and so on. So we have designed the model where care wallets subscribe to the right events on the same chain and see the right events, but not everything. And in doing so, we can give everyone the right view of what's happening about Pradeep's care. As a specialist who wants to to do a specialized test on me, they really need to know which physician I went to see, what the referral card says about my need for a specialized test, uh, what's my pre-existing conditions that may impact the test, and so on. They really don't need to see anything related to my financial data between me and the physician. So every entity on the chain has a specialized role, and that role links to another role in a pair. So each pair can be governed by a set of contracts that Restrict me to what I can see, restrict me to what I can do, and it doesn't require some third party like a police cop in the middle saying, thou shall not do this or thou shall do that. So this notion of pairs defining relation, pair implementing relationships allow us to handle every use case practically in healthcare that exists, but again, to adapt it to the local systems, to connect it to the local background systems, we need that community of developers and clinicians in each each uh, major economy, okay. if you will. Let's make it a minor economy, okay? okay? Let's take the Netherlands. We're a teeny penal little country with 17 million people, 100 hospitals, uh, 8,000 uh, 8, GPs, and a bunch of labs and everything, and about 90 billion it, in healthcare costs, uh, euro, so 100, mil, 100 billion dollars. Where, who would start using that? Where would it? Where would we use your system? So uh, um, let's take three simple use cases. First is me, my ability to schedule with you when I need to come see you. As a, you are the physician, I'm the patient. So patient, physician scheduling. We both have a care wallet, and I can schedule. I can see your deck of cards in my wallet. Not to get into too much detail, but I can instantly schedule an appointment with you, and you can instantly reschedule an appointment with me. When you, we do that to our wallets, it can load into our respective calendars behind the scenes. So we're simply sending a care event both onto the ledger, and from the ledger, we're also sending it to the uh, scheduling. So if you're using Outlook Calendar, if you're using your iPhone as your calendaring system, it will load that event, and it will read your events. But what we are doing by doing a direct scheduling and putting it on the blockchain is that I, as an employer, I'm also aware that Pradeep's going in for a uh, schedule appointment from 11 to 3 p.m. on a Tuesday. So it is every day, the HR manager there is informed of they need to be aware of this claim being generated if I'm an employer paid. So you like so you like it to be a nice, uh, well, let's go into that because, I mean, you need to connect to my phone. Fine, you can do that. But you also need to connect to the healthcare, you know, the, the, the hospital system or the the, the uh, first, uh, first level uh, care system. You need to connect to all these thousands of <laughs> different systems which exist in our teeny little country which you've been doing you know at blue cross uh, in your in your state why would that be easier with a blockchain than in any other uh, circumstances so um, the, the main purpose here is that we are not actually trying to store content on blockchain we are handling event between parties mm -hmm. these events today actually are recorded nowhere see what happens today is uh, what we look at in every healthcare system is the outcome of certain chain of events. So you, I make an appointment with you, I come to see you, then eventually a clinical report is generated from my visit, and that's really all everybody looks at from that point on. 
what happens in between is all these steps that occur that actually govern costs and quality that are ever never actually captured in any system or in any centralized or decentralized system. Yep. So we are, is, we are a very thin, very light fabric which is not trying to replace electronic health records. It's not trying to replace your existing clinical system. It's trying to sit next to it and say, look, when Pradeep uh, and Vincent are interacting with each other from a scheduling point of view, from a referral point of view, from an eligibility determination point of view, from a care guidance point of view, those events are lost today. Let's capture them in between the two care wallets. We capture them, but you still have to connect to my GP. You still have to connect to my healthcare or uh, hospital. So, you know, suppose we would get started in the Netherlands. Would we start with an hospital? Would we start with, uh, would you integrate with the main US healthcare hospital systems which are here or would you start somewhere else to, tap, to tap that event-driven information? So um, let's look at the use case. If you look at scheduling event, we will only need to connect to the, to the calendar. So each hospital or each physician practice or an individual practicing doctor has a calendar. Most of it is managed in typical, you know, your Outlook calendaring or shared calendaring system. So we would have to inject into that calendaring system the, the scheduling event. So that's a relatively simple, lightweight task of saying, I need to be able to schedule an event. For example, on your phone, when you make an appointment, it goes to your Outlook automatically. It's a very simple integration where your phone calendar and Outlook are synced. Sure. So that thing is an easy example of how we would allow direct patient provider scheduling to occur, but not have some heavy integration with the back end. But the value proposition of this scheduling event is obviously significant in that not just my calendar and your calendar sync, the same calendaring event is also known to the insurance company, to the employer, to the specialist, to the nurse, to the pharmacist, and so on. Okay. Most of the time, care coordination doesn't need to know why I'm coming to see you. It needs to know that I am coming to see you, right? We are mostly trying to manage the event of scheduling, not the scheduling details. True. So that's your question about what we won't keep on the chain. We're not going to keep the clinical records on the chain. Of course. Why you, what the doctor said to me when I went to see him is part of the medical clinical record that he maintains or she maintains. I need to know there is a record that was generated from my visit but I don't necessarily need to see the record as an employer or as a as a specialist. So it's it's all about need to know. Okay. I don't want everything to everyone. Let's go to the care coin, which you basically have defined. When is that going to be uh, the can the can token? When is that going to be involved in the process? So there are two different tokens. Uh, care coin is actually a payment currency that is issued inside our closed network by the issuer. So whoever is writing the check. Government, employer, or insurance are typically the people who pay for care. So either of those three can issue care coin inside a network of physicians and labs and pharmacies to act as a denominated value token that I as a consumer can pay you as a physician directly, but you redeem it from the insurance company. And what it does is lets me completely get out of the middle from managing point-to-point -point sale and point-to-point -point payment. It saves enormous amount of money. It reduces a lot of fraud because you are now getting paid instantly as a physician, but when you come to redeem those coins, I have the ability to have validated the services were delivered, the right service was delivered for the right outcome, you didn't make me sicker, you also didn't over-treat me. So those are, uh, the care coin is a closed loop currency that is operated inside our platform, but issued by our clients, insurance companies, large employers, government agencies, and hospitals. So they issue care coin backed by their own reserves. In effect, Instead of paying you dollars, they're paying you coins so you can redeem them once a month. Uh, and that streamlines the doctor-patient payment dramatically. Uh, again, the whole vision is me as an insurance company don't really want to be between the, the doctor and the patient, governing and dictating every step. I want to allow care to flow and payments to flow without losing complete control over the whole ecosystem. So that's where the care coin comes into play. CAN is actually the token that runs the platform. So those who need to use the platform from a care wallet perspective, those who want to connect the care protocol to their backend systems, those who want to configure a closed loop network of physicians and, doc and labs and pharmacists to serve you as a patient, the, that client is, is using CAN tokens to, uh, to pay us. So in effect, this, instead of paying us in dollars, they're paying us in CAN tokens. And they're paying a denominated value in CAN tokens. So CAN is a gas, like ether gas, you have an Ethereum platform. 
And that token is purely a utility token. Uh, and the reason we issued 1 billion tokens for sale is that we calculated that a single medium-sized hospital in the US and similarly in Netherlands would need about 50 million tokens a year to operate on a, about a 250 to 300,000 life hospital. A hospital that serves about 250,000 um, uh, patients in the US would need about 50 million tokens, I'm sorry, 20 million tokens a year. And 50 to clients would consume the entire supply. At which point we'll start seeing obviously a complete saturation of our token supply, but you would also see the tokens to then escalate in value and, and certainly would split further. Um, we are currently talking to one care delivery network in the US that serves 300,000 plus consumers, has 6,000 physicians and 282 facilities in just one state. And if we were to, and they are our first client, if we turn them on, they will end up consuming more like 40 million tokens in a single year. So therefore we know that 20 to 30 such clients will consume their entire supply. But we also then did a lot of modeling. We hired some economists. We have Dr. Randall on our board as a health economist. We tried to really model what would the supply of tokens need to be to have adequate supply of liquidity, uh, assuming between seven to 14% liquidity on a given day, what would be the demand from a client on a given day? How many clients do we expect to have in three years? At what point do we expect to see this go global? And, and how many different, uh, yeah, you know, we are also looking at India as a hospital system adopting our platform. We're talking to a government agency right now that is very keen on using our platform to serve a specialized population that needs a lot of mental health support. So there are so many uh, very unique use cases that are already emerging. Uh, and we are looking at the supply and going, do we have enough supply of tokens? And our models show that we do. It's neither too much nor too little. Uh, but yeah, we do expect that we're going to end up seeing the token really become the, uh, the de facto currency for healthcare uh, delivery on a blockchain, at least using our system. Okay. So you, uh, the first price of the token is 31 cents. So you're talking about raising 400 million uh, of uh, of um, US dollars in the in, in what in what time frame do you foresee that? So actually our target to raise our threshold is 25 million. We believe that at 25 million we have enough capital to deliver our first two clients, which are very large implementations. And they really prove out our case around patient provider uh, scheduling, provider provider referral, and patient provider payment and uh, provider uh, uh, performance measurement. Those are the four big use cases we are after. I should be able to use my wallet to schedule, visit, get a referral, go see the specialist and pay both. That's our vision for the very simple but very complex workflow to achieve okay, that. So the initial, in the initial ICO is only like 75 million tokens. Yeah, the initial ICO, our vision is that we will raise 25 million and at a point in time we are, we are moving forward with the full execution of our platform and our clients contract. Now we will raise as much up to as much as 257 million and we'll cap it. And the vision of that is that we have defined three very different levels of releases. The 25 million lets us launch in the US. A, a next year lets us launch in the G7, English speaking countries. And then the, the full amount lets us launch globally. We don't necessarily want to achieve a global launch today, but we also know that to do a global launch, we need to do all the things necessary that we talked about earlier. So do we need the full 257 today? No, we don't. And if we had it, we would park it in a safe place and grow into it. Uh, so our, our goal is not to spend this money, but rather to use it. But here is the positive side of raising the money, because argue, arguably, when you have large reserves, you can get larger contracts. A single healthcare delivery network contract in the U.S. can easily be a billion dollars a year or more in CareCoin payments. So when I walked into a recently a government agency and I said to them, I'd like to use CareCoins to pay your providers, uh, they loved it. They loved the idea that they can actually pay physicians real time with something that the physician can tangibly hold in their wallet. They can measure physician performance and reward them additional tokens for better outcomes, like me staying healthy. Uh, but they also asked me the question, look, if we were to just give you 10% of our population, that is high, high risk population or high need population, we would be paying four and a half billion dollars a year in care coins each year. We are okay with that, Mr. Pretty, but do you have the operating reserves? How much capital do you have in the bank to handle that size of a contract? 
And if I were to say 5% or 200 million, I would fly. If I said to them, I have 20 million in the bank, they would just sorry, you're too small, we'll fly the app. It's, so a, big, it's it, a big world out there. And um, if you start with too big a number, so you, they will crush you. Okay, so in 60 days, you're going to do your token sales. What are you uh, doing in the meantime? I saw you were in uh, Dublin. I saw that you were, um, you were in Barcelona at the, uh, the blockchain event. What are you doing to prepare for that ICO? You know, to be candid, we are right now focused on getting a first client contract signed, which is a very complex negotiation that's happening, and negotiating with our second client, which I mentioned, a government agency. We are very pleasantly surprised at the interest we are getting from traditional large care delivery networks, whether they're commercial or, or government, is far sooner than I anticipated. And it's far more um, accepting of the ideas of care wallet, care cards, and care coins. Mm -hmm. So we are really focused on getting the contracts done. Uh, the second thing we're doing is I have a team of about 50 people building the platform right now. Uh, most of them are based in our Ucrosoft location, and then I have also a big team in U.S. that's guiding us at what to build. So where, I have all the business. Your, uh, where was your development team? Uh, I bought a company in Ukraine in early 2017 called Ukrasoft in Kiev, Ukraine. Yeah. And that organization is building a platform. We have a team of almost uh, 50 people there. I think it's a little bit over 50 now. Uh, developers, testers, QA, business analysts, architects, you name it, the entire. And it's a full-blown mature organization. So our first priority right now is to release a platform for commercial use March 31st. And that is actually for 1,500 physicians and about 100,000 consumers and about 60 hospitals and labs and pharmacies. We have a clear deliverable. We must do it. Uh, and it's all based on our uh, our design and architecture that I've laid out uh, very, very publicly. Okay. How's the, company, how's the company been funded so far? Uh, I have shared the... I have self-funded it so far. Uh, I've put in about $3 million uh, personally to bring it this far. Uh, and we'll continue to do that till we... We also expect to see revenue begin as early as January. Uh, well, we, our contracts bring us revenue in January. So uh, we will fund it from personal funds plus the contract revenue from our client. Plus we will obviously look to raise money to the token set. Okay. The last company, not the, 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 the companies you have built so far, the, the, the four companies before. How big, or how big were they when you, before you got out? My, big, my biggest one was um, uh, about $7 million in revenue a year, 600 people. Uh, and I built that over the course of about four years from scratch. 70, how much million? $87 million in revenue. Seven, and revenue. And what's it? $7 million in revenue. 87. Yeah. Oh, 87. 87 million in revenue, 600 people. And that, that and you sold that to who did no, you that sell? It was, uh, was merged with a, with a hedge fund that financed us. So it was actually taken over by our financiers. And it still continues on. Okay, good. All righty. Well, this is a small, there's been a small introduction into, uh, into your platform. People can uh, go take a look at solve.care. And, uh, and look at the number of documents and uh, your roadmap and uh, the explanation of uh, explanation of it. But um, it's been very useful. Thank you very much for your um, thank you very much for your um, your your story. And uh, I hope we can basically get you to the Netherlands on uh, next year, beginning of next year. Would be delighted to have you there. In the uh, so we have the crypto economy roadshow, which is going on there. And it would be uh, really interesting. So it would be a pleasure. And I used to live in Netherlands, so I, I always need uh, no excuse to come back. Cool. Thank you.